All right, hi. Uh, this is a re-recording of the very first lecture that I gave uh, that uh, many of you were not able to see because of uh, this and that, because we had some technical problems on the first day. So what I want to talk about is parasitism. Uh, specifically, I want to talk about what parasitism is and what it isn't. Parasit Parasitism is one important class of relationship related to each other. And the person who has pushed this in the modern age uh, more than anybody else uh, was Dr. Lynn Margulis, uh, who's here. She spent most of her career at the University of Massachusetts. I'm honored to say that I got to meet her, um, uh, see her speak once, and uh, actually meet her and have dinner once. Uh, probably the one of the most famous people I've ever gotten to uh, meet in person. And in 1970, uh, she published a book called Origin of Eukaryotic Cells under her married name, uh, Lynn Sagan, I might add, if you ever want to look it up. And she did like all scientists, she drew on ideas from her predecessors, notably a Russian guy by the name of Mieteskovsky and an American biologist named Ivan Wallen. But by 1970, this newfangled thing called molecular biology was starting to really take off. Remember, it was only in the mid-50s that we had worked out the structure of DNA uh, but that horse had jumped out and just started tearing off down the road. Uh, we'd worked out transcription, translation. It was uh, just becoming possible to sequence DNA, although it was not easy at the time. Electron microscopy had taken off, and it was possible to see all kinds of structures inside cells that weren't visible before. And she came up with the idea that's now very well known, uh, that virtually everyone agrees that she got right. And that's the idea that eukaryotic mitochondria and eukaryotic chloroplast as well are descended from ancestors that were free living bacteria. Ancestors that either penetrated or got engulfed by a host eukaryote. It's not important for our purposes um, who, whether the symbionts were maybe preying on the host or the host was trying to eat the symbionts. However it happened, these bacteria entered a host very early eukaryotic cell and took up residence inside uh, they weren't digested, and the two ended up becoming mutually dependent on each other. Now, you can learn a lot more about this from uh, Dr. Naylor, for example, who specializes in the study of mitochondria. If you've taken or you will take my invertebrate zoology class, we go over a lot more of the supporting evidence for this. But Margulis spent a great deal of time working on the idea that symbiosis was far more widespread than just early eukaryotes. That's not the only time that it ever happened. Uh, this is an example. This is a coral polyp. Uh, corals belong to the same phylum as jellyfish and sea anemones and things like that. Uh, but tropical corals that build reefs depend on having single-celled algae of a type called dinoflagellates living inside their tissues and carrying out photosynthesis. Uh, the dinoflagellates get a place to live, and the coral periodically harvests them uh, to gain uh, food for itself. Uh, there are some corals that have lost the ability to feed uh, because they are so dependent on their dinoflagellates. And you might well ask the philosophical question, 
Oh, do we have two separate organisms here or do we have one? And there are examples like this all over the animal kingdom. Everywhere people have looked, you can find symbiotic associations. And Margulis spent a great deal of her career drawing attention to just how common this is, how symbiosis is absolutely everywhere. She went so far as to argue that symbiosis was far more important in evolution than what we tend to call neo-Darwinism, which is basically evolutionary population genetics. If you've had population genetics or been exposed to it, you might remember things like the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, or P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared equals 1, and all of that, uh, where you use uh, mathematics to model the change of allele frequencies from one generation to the next over time. Uh, so between 1950 and now, the frequency of the dark-colored allele in peppered moths goes from over 90% to less than 10%, things like that. Margulis argued that this kind of beanbag genetics was a minor thing compared to symbiosis as far as generating real organismal diversity, creating new adaptations new types of organisms, symbiosis was everything, neo-Darwinism was nothing. Neo-Darwinism must be dismissed as a minor 20th century religious sect. That's a burn. Within the sprawling religious persuasion of Anglo-Saxon biology, mind you, I'm not sure what that is, but a quaint but potentially dangerous aberration that ensures scientific failure Major questions posed by zoologists cannot be answered from inside the neo-Darwinian straitjacket. Uh, when I got to hear her speak in, I believe, 1998, uh, she was so vehemently against neo-Darwinism that I was afraid she was going to start attacking neo-Darwinists. I was kind of waiting for the moment when a bunch of people in Chairman Mao caps carrying AK-47s uh, we're going to burst out and start lining people up against the wall. Very, very forceful speaker. Most of us work in stiffs, however, see symbiosis not as a refutation of neo-Darwinism, but as an expansion of it. Darwinian evolution is basically organisms vary. The variation can be inherited. And at least some of that variation makes a difference in the probability of reproduction. And as John Maynard Smith pointed out, there's no contradiction between that and the idea that, you know, symbiosis could essentially be a new source of variation. Organisms can vary because they have different alleles, which are created by mutation, but they can also vary if they acquire uh, different symbionts, and selection could act on this. Uh, so there are lots more ways that you can generate the diversity for selection to act on than just simply s sitting around and twiddling your thumbs and waiting for a mutation to come along. So most would agree that Margulis expanded evolutionary biology immensely. So what types of symbiosis are there? In mutualism, both the host and the symbiont benefit. Bees and flowers, for example. Bees get nectar and pollen. Flowers get to reproduce through pollination. Commensalism, you have symbiosis in which the symbiont benefits and the host is not significantly helped or harmed. The host is pretty neutral towards the whole thing. One example would be cattle egrets walking around in a cow pasture. Where the cows walk, they kick up insects, and the cattle egrets eat them. The cows, as far as I know, are not significantly benefited or harmed either way. Parasitism is what we're going to focus on, and that's symbiosis in which the symbiont benefits and the host is harmed. You can have other types of symbiosis. Uh, 
although some would argue that these are not real symbiosis, in amensalism, one partner is harmed and the other is neither helped nor harmed. You know, if I step on an ant walking to my office, the ant is harmed, I'm not particularly helped nor harmed either way. And again, that may not seem like it should be considered symbiosis. And then if you have a relationship in which both partners are harmed, uh, you might call it competition. Uh, you might also call it spite. Uh, there is actually some interesting research being done on whether spite exists in the living world, whether you have organisms that will harm themselves in order to harm another. Um, I won't really have much time to talk about that further, but that's an interesting question as to whether and to what extent that really happens. Now, in predation, uh, you also have one partner benefits and the other one being harmed. The cat benefits by being able to eat the mouse. Uh, the mouse is harmed because it's dead and is going to get eaten and then probably regurgitated on the front porch, which is what usually happens at my house. But there's differences. Predation is a short-term relationship. Uh, the cat might live 12 years, the mouse might live several years, the predator-prey encounter might only take seconds. Uh, whether the prey gets away or whether the prey gets eaten, uh, the encounter between prey and predator does not take up a very large fraction of the lifespan of either one. The predator is usually bigger than the prey, uh, the predator will eat many prey in its lifetime. That cat might eat um, dozens of mice, hundreds maybe, I don't really know. And the predator causes the prey's death. For the predator to be successful, the prey has to die. That's very different from a parasitic relationship like these blood flukes in the genus Schistosoma, uh, these can infect a range of vertebrates, including there are several species uh, that can infect humans. And in some parts of the world, they're a pretty serious public health problem. Uh, adult schistosoma will spend its entire life in a human host. And the human might be infected by schistosoma for decades. So the parasitic relationship lasts a much longer fraction of the lifespan of both the host and the parasite. The parasite is smaller. The parasite can only infect a single host at each life cycle stage. Uh, these worms will infect only one human. Uh, they can't move from human to human. And parasites don't automatically kill their hosts. You can live for a long time with schistosoma infection. You can die from a really severe one. Uh, really bad schistosoma infections can cause pretty severe liver damage, but it's not the automatic outcome. In fact, parasites may be selected not to kill their hosts uh, because if you're a parasite and you kill your host too fast, you lose the ability to reproduce yourself. Uh, so it may actually improve the chances of a parasite survival if it doesn't uh, automatically kill its host. So that can happen, but it's not the expected outcome the way it's expected that a predator will always kill prey. The other difference is that many predators can eat a wide range of prey. That cat that we saw might kill mice, rats, birds, uh, cicadas. Um, our cats kill cicadas a lot. My, uh, uh, my wife refers to them as screaming chicken nuggets because of what the, uh, uh, because of the way the cats treat them. Uh, this leopard right here has been uh, leopards have been seen preying on at least 92 different species, everything from catfish to baby giraffes. There are a few predators that are restricted to a narrow range of prey species. Uh, there's only one 
that is known right now that seems to be truly monophagous, which means it's restricted to only a single prey species. It happens to be a spider called Amozenus that feeds on only one species of termite. So most predators can take a pretty wide range of prey. There are some parasites that have that kind of mass appeal uh, that can parasitize multiple species, but it's much more common in the parasite world that a parasite can only parasitize one host species uh, or at best a small group of closely related species. So for example, there are five species of the parasite Plasmodium that parasitize humans None of them can parasitize any other primates. Uh, there are species of plasmodium that parasitize chimps and that parasitize monkeys, and they cannot normally parasitize us. Uh, there's much greater degree of host specificity. Uh, up here at the top, you have a chewing louse that belongs to a group of parasitic insects called the Malophaga, that feed on host uh, dead skin, sometimes blood or live skin, uh, hair and feathers. And this particular one, Strigophilus gary larsoni, uh, was named after the famous cartoonist, incidentally. And as far as we know, it is only found on one species of bird, uh, the northern white-faced owl of Central Africa, uh, which you see right there. Uh, so it's pretty common for parasites to have only one host. It's very rare for predators to only have one host. And you have some cases that are kind of in between. You might be wondering where mosquitoes fit in. They're like predators in that they interact relatively briefly. It may only take a few seconds for a mosquito to take a blood meal from you. Um, of course, then you have the itch to deal with, but that usually fades within minutes to hours. And mosquitoes can feed on multiple hosts over their lifespan. One mosquito might bite uh, many people or might go from, I don't know, human to cat to dog to deer, something like that. They can feed on a wide range of hosts. They can feed on multiple hosts and they interact briefly with their hosts that makes them like predators, but they're smaller than their hosts and normally they don't kill them, uh, which makes them like parasites. Organisms like that are sometimes called intermittent parasites. Uh, they may also be called micro predators and they are a kind of gray area organism because in some ways they act like predators and in others they act like parasites. One more gray area, this is a tomato hornworm caterpillar. These are pretty common on tomato plants. Uh, you may have seen them if you've ever grown tomatoes. This particular one was attacked by a parasitic wasp uh, that laid eggs inside it. And the eggs hatched into little grubs, uh, little larvae. And the larvae have been crawling through the caterpillar's body eating its vital organs, uh, saving the most vital ones for last, by the way. I'm not sure how they know how to do that. Uh, feeding on the caterpillar's uh, stores of fat. And by this stage, they have all crawled out of the caterpillar and formed pupae, uh, formed these cocoons. And the cocoons will eventually hatch and adult wasp will fly out and go on to infect another caterpillar. And by this stage, the caterpillar is pretty much a shell of itself. Uh, it's either dead or it's barely alive and, and dying. Wasps like this in the genus Cotesia are known as parasitoids. They're just like parasites, except that parasitoids always kill the host. Uh, this caterpillar is, if it's not dead, it's going to be pretty soon. This caterpillar can't live. It certainly will never become a butterfly. And parasitoids are extremely diverse in the insect world. As far as I know, every insect that's ever been studied 
has a species of parasitoid uh, wasp that infects it. So parasitoids may be as diverse as all other insects put together. Okay, that would seem to be the end of that. That went by fairly quickly. Uh, thank you all. And um, I will upload this and hopefully you will find this thing helpful. So I will now proceed to stop recording. Uh, have a good day. Or I will try to stop recording as soon as I can find uh, the button.